this is Lisa from Mobile Tech Review, and this is the ASUS ZenBook Prime UX31, ASUS's second generation Ultrabook. And I'm going to tell you right now, don't watch this video if your, your budget's already kind of broken and you don't want to be tempted, because this is one awesome Ultrabook, and we're going to look at it now. So this is the second generation ASUS ZenBook Prime. Prime this time, and that indicates the 1080p display. Really cool, right? In an Ultrabook to have 1080p, well, it's pretty cool actually in any notebook to have 1080p. The best things have stayed the same, and you know, the ZenBook was one of the Ultrabooks that everybody loved when it first came out. Well, then again, that wasn't such a hard thing because it was one of the first Windows Ultrabooks that hit the market, so there wasn't much to compare it to, and, and some other companies came out with things like more ports, uh, backlit keyboards, better keyboards, that kind of thing. Asus listened to everything that we all said, though, with the second gen, and they've come back with what probably will stand out as being one of the best second generation Ultrabooks throughout the life cycle. To take a look, you can see absurdly, absurdly thin. Three millimeters in the front, going back to nine millimeters at the back. And it's made of glorious, luxurious, perfectly put together metal. Those, those little uh, problems that plague the ASUS Transformer Prime Android tablet, they're not here. This thing is put together just perfectly. Swirl metal top here, slightly different color than first gen. A little bit more toned down. I think people who prefer that understated kind of look are going to like this one even a little bit better. A little bit less flashy, literally less flashy, less shiny. And take a look at the side here, you can see the beautiful taper here. Uh, Apple recently managed the patent tapering notebook, so we'll see how that goes. But anyway, lovely looking design. We've got a little flashing light here that tells it the notebook is asleep. And we've got display ports here, not the display port as in that kind of port, but little mini adapter ports for HDMI and VGA. A USB 3.0 port right here, and this is where you plug your charger in. And this USB port supports charging. Looking around the back, lovely brushed aluminum hinge here. Everything is put together just perfectly. No creaks, no gaps, no complaints. And on this side, another USB 3.0 port with charging. There's your headphone or headphone combo mic jack and your SD card slot. There is no Ethernet here. But, you know ASUS, they like to give you nice little dongles in the box. So, now, these little guys may be kind of a pain because you have to use dongle adapters, but ASUS, well, they're really good about giving the little dongles in the bag so that ameliorates some of our complaints. For example, if you want Ethernet, don't worry, you got Ethernet. Because they give you this cute little pouch right here. Just like they did with the last Zenbook, and you get and wrapped in pretty plastic to start with. Here's your USB Ethernet adapter, so yes, you can do Ethernet. That will use up one of your two USB ports, that's the only drawback. And here's our mini VGA adapter, also wrapped in plastic right now. And they don't give you the HDMI adapter because this is standard micro HDMI, so you just use a micro HDMI cable that you're probably already using with your smartphone, for example. And if you're not, well, they're easy to find at Best Buy, Radio Shack, Fry's, that kind of thing. And speaking of what you get, Here's the box. We don't really show boxes too often, but this is a very attractive, nice box. Ultrabooks tend to come nicely packaged, many of them. Sturdy, nice. And speaking of sturdy, you see, I'm not even worrying about laying this fairly heavy box on top of the computer because that thing is put together solidly. Inside the notebook sits in this bay right here. And you obviously get the little baggie of dongle adapters, but wait, there's more. Huh. This wouldn't be a Seuss if you didn't get your matching ballistic nylon kind of sleeve for it. Aesthetic match for the nice little dongle baggie, and, well, you know, it gets the job done. Love, kind of a leather-like flap here, magnetic closure, protects the device, protects other things from the device. All right, let's open it up and see what makes it so special besides the usual drop-dead gorgeous Zen book look. First off, it has an SSD drive, so it's just going to wake up instantly and be ready to play. Alright, now we've got it opened up so you can see what's really special going on inside. If the uh, exterior case wasn't good enough for you, obviously we've got to have good components inside. And the real show stealer here is the 1080p display. Beautiful matte display also. Gone is the glossy Ultrabook that you can't see under lots of lights, fluorescent or incandescent, whatever they are. Nice colors here. Very sharp, very crisp, and surprisingly readable. I really wondered how this would stand up, say, against the Sony Vio Z, which is also a 1080p display. And, of course, 
that's a very high-end item there. And I thought, well, this is probably going to cut corners to bring this to us for $1,100. Well, I'm happy to say this is a very fine panel here. Nice colors. Very sharp. Text is actually readable. Now, Asus ships this at 125% for your Windows fonts to start with here. That makes things a little bit more readable. And they have the text zoom set in IE, which you can just control yourself using control plus and control minus, set to 125%. And that certainly helps. And, and that's the thing. There is versatility here. If you find the fonts are a little sm small, you can play with the fonts like that. But you still got the ability to see full native 1080p on the screen without having to squish it back down or send it out via HDMI to a larger monitor. And you can have Windows running side by side. You've got your Word document open, your web page document open at the same time. Good times. Really stunning for an Ultrabook in this price range. And as I said, this is the Core i5 1.7 GHz third generation Intel Ivy Bridge CPU with Intel HD 4000 graphics and a 128 gig SSD. And ours has the Sandforce controller. It's made by ADATA. And that starts at $1,100. Some retailers might actually discount it. The crazy Micro Center right now actually has $100 off, so it's $999. And then there's a couple of other configurations. You can get it with the i7 also running at 1.7 GHz, still a dual core. There are no quad core ULV CPUs. And a 256 gig SSD for around $1,500 or so. So, good stuff for the price. The next thing is the keyboard. One of the things we didn't like about the original ZenBook was the incredibly shallow, mediocre keyboard. Not a good typing experience. And Obviously, I spend a lot of time writing and I care about the keyboard, and it really got old quickly. It was just hard to type well. Asus has added a lot of key travel here. They really listened. Much better key travel. Nice tactile feedback. Good spread of the keys. Key separation here. And they added backlighting. Yay! And we're going to show you what that looks like in the dark in a minute. And we'll also show you light bleed, because that always seems to be a problem with IPS panels in general, and ASUS has been more plagued with it than some other vendors. And this has a little bit of light bleed, but nothing bad. The trackpad has also been improved. Now, I didn't have as much trouble with the trackpad on the original ZenBook as some reviewers did, but it was not the easiest to use or the most responsive. Here we've got a large, buttonless trackpad. Uh, well behaved. It actually acts normally. And it's large enough to do multi-finger gestures, all that kind of thing. So no complaints there. Not as stellar as using, say, a MacBook Air under Mac OS, but it's pretty darn good. Very livable. My only complaint, palm rejection could be better, given how large it is. If you're typing, it's easy to brush it and move your cursor around by accident. You can turn off the trackpad completely if you want, and that's particularly useful if you're going to use an external mouse. Like the last ZenBook, this has audio by Bang & Olufsen, and it sounds very good for an Ultrabook. Uh, nice stereo separation. The speakers are on the underside. We'll show you that in a minute. Stereo sound. Pretty good volume, too. And we'll play that. And if you take a look in here, you can see the ventilation. Lots of big grids in there. And notice I got rid of that script that they used to have underneath the display as part of the branding. And it seems like nobody liked that very much, so, well, they whacked that. Now, looking at the bottom... This slit right here is a speaker hole. This slit right here is a speaker hole. You've got your rubber feet, nice metal bottom, very industrial stainless steel looking, and plenty of air vents. Now this stays pretty cool on the bottom. If you're doing something like playing games or streaming video, it will blow some hot air out the vents. Pretty quiet though. Most of the time this thing is really silent. And it'll reach about 101 degrees right on this spot. The rest of it stays pretty cool, low 90s generally speaking. And the top surface of the keyboard does not get hot. As we take a look at the keyboard here, the backlighting is actually on at the moment. It's hard to tell. It does have an ambient light sensor that can control that, or you can override it. But you can see here we've got oversized shift keys, which is a good thing, this one being larger. The arrow pad here that does double duty as page up, page down, that kind of thing when you hit the FN key. The only thing I don't like is the delete key has been swapped with the power button right here, so it's really easy to keep accidentally hitting that power button at first when you need to, need to hit delete. Once you get used to it, well, you can break the habit. The FN row up here, you can see you've got sleep, wireless control, keyboard backlighting, brightness control, just like a Mac, it's display brightness. You can mute your volume, raise it up and down, turn your trackpad on and off, toggle external displays on and off, all normal stuff there. And here we are displaying a pure black image, and you can see on the display that, well, the, the black backlight bleed is really not bad at all. There's a little bit at the bottom here, but nothing I would complain about. And you can see backlit keyboard. Nice, easy to see, rings of light around each key. And kind of a cool whitish. 
The power key and the wireless key are always illuminated. Caps lock key illuminates if you turn on caps lock. And now taking a look at the side view when it's open, you can see this is how far back the display goes, which is perfectly fine for me because this is an IPS display. You don't have to do any of that moving the display forward and back to find your sweet spot. It's pretty much viewable anywhere. And as you can see, even from this extreme viewing angle and on video here, you can still make out the picture on the screen. That's because it really does have those nice wide IPS viewing angles. The machine has 4 gigs of RAM and this is your usual Ultrabook kind of design here so everything is sealed inside. You can't upgrade that. It's DDR3 RAM and again Intel HD 4000 integrated graphics. No dedicated graphics here. Ultrabooks there really just isn't room for that or for the heat dissipation or for the size of the heat sink that that would require. But the good news is Intel HD 4000 graphics are a lot faster as you've heard if you've watched our other reviews you know that so it really ups the performance from the last generation Sandy Bridge that we looked at, and you can you can play some light games with it. Certainly games like Left 4 Dead 2 that are very, well, underpowered friendly, and even if you want to play Skyrim, as long as you don't mind low settings and dropping down the resolution to something 1366 by 768, you can do that in a pinch. Uh, this is not your dedicated gaming machine by any means. This is your, your mobile get things done kind of machine. If you want to do things like lots of HD video editing, uh, I don't recommend an Ultrabook for that. ULV CPUs are not as powerful as their full mobile counterparts, and there is no dedicated graphics here. Now, if you're just going to do it once in a while for fun, you know, the old family home videos, that kind of thing, yeah, it's fine for that. It's going to take longer than it would with a faster machine, but it's okay. But for those of you who really have to do that kind of thing frequently, not so much. For those of you who need to do some Photoshop on the go, it's perfectly adequate for that. Now, again, I wouldn't use this as my primary machine. I actually did try to do that, editing lots of uh, raw files every day, and it gets a little slow, i got to say, compared to using a full mobile CPU or obviously a desktop CPU, but it's not like you're going to wait forever for a filter to happen or something like that. It's just not going to be instantly fast. When it comes to the two CPUs that are available, like I said, both the Core i5 and i7 are clocked at 1.7 gigahertz. So you get a little performance of the advantage out of that i7. I don't look at that as being nearly as important probably as getting an upgrade to a 256 gig SSD. With 128 gigs, we had about 70 or so free after installing Office and Windows and just the basics on it. And the recovery partition takes up 10 gigs. Now you can make recovery USB keys or hard drives or DVDs and then whack that partition. It takes a little geekiness though because of the way it's been set up. You have to use disk part to do that kind of thing. But then you can get yourself a 10 gig second drive. You say your D drive, it'll show up as. Because the recovery partition and the regular C drive are not next to each other, you can't use uh, the disk manager built into Windows to just extend the size of your C drive. For our Windows Experience Index, you can see what our scores are right here. 6.9 for the CPU, 5.9 for the RAM, 5.9 for graphics for Arrow, and 6.4 for gaming graphics. So it's always a little bit optimistic in my opinion, Windows Experience Index there. And the hard drive 7.9 maximum score because again it has that A data fast SSD with the Sandforce controller inside. In terms of other synthetic benchmarks, Scored 2800 on 3D Mark Vantage, which isn't bad. That's a lot better than the 1500 or so we saw with the last generation Zenbook. And for PC Mark Vantage, it scored 12,774. Very good. Again, Ultrabooks tend to score higher in PC Mark Vantage because of the advantage of the SSD drive, which PC Mark Vantage gives a lot of weight to. Those drives are a lot faster than conventional spinning hard drives. Machine ships with Bluetooth and it has dual band Intel Wi Fi 811 BGN with Intel WiDi wireless display support. And software bundle is pretty restrained on this. You get your usual Office 2010 starter edition, McAfee trial edition for antivirus software, and a whole slew of ASUS utilities over here and drivers and things. They have their software update, they have a tutor application, they have their e manual, they have their cloud storage service on board here. And uh, interestingly, for the keyboard over here, if you hit the FN key plus the C, you can use that so-called ASUS Splendid utility that's been around forever, and that will change through a bunch of different color profiles. Now, when we first got the machine at firmware 2.04, and using anything but the normal profile, look, jaundiced yellow is pretty bizarre. But we got a firmware update immediately out of the box. It said optional, believe me, it's not optional, because it gets rid of that jaundiced yellow look, and it brings things back to normal. And I'll show you what I mean here. We cycle through them. Right 
Press normal mode, gamma correction mode, vivid. They're all still, to my mind, a little on the yellow side. Theater mode. Theater mode is kind of nice. It enhances the colors and the contrast even further, and they're already really top notch on this, but it can make movies look a little bit more dramatic. Soft mode, which is a cooler. A custom profile that you can create yourself if you want to color correct this, and then we're back to normal mode again. Overall, under normal mode, the color calibration is pretty reasonable and normal. Slightly on the warm side, but in a pleasing way, and that's, that's a refreshing change from most notebook displays that are way too cool, making people look a little ghoulish, bluish, greenish, you know, relatively speaking. This is pretty natural. The grays are pretty neutral. It's what it should be. Contrast on this, extremely high. Very nice. Very good deep blacks on it. And ASUS claims this is a 350 nit display. I'd say it's more like a 300 or so for what we've measured, which is still very bright. So it's a good one to be using in bright locations, maybe even outdoors. Good stuff. Battery life on this, we're still trying to kill it. This has the new Intel 22 nanometer process CPU. The smaller your CPU gets, the more power frugal it gets and the cooler it gets. That's why it doesn't get too hot, That's why it runs a long time. The CPU only uses 17 watts of power. I have been trying now for a day to kill the battery. It's just really astounding. I would say that you're going to get at least seven hours out of this thing with normal use. Now, if you're streaming movies, it's going to be shorter, that kind of thing. But for everyday office, web, email, that kind of stuff, hard to kill it. And now we've got Windows Meter Player going with the usual three tracks that you get with uh, every Windows installation. You can hear the, how good this sounds. This is at about a little, about three quarters volume. Sounds pretty nice. Reasonable volume, reasonably full for a machine this size. Now we'll check out video playback. And now for some video playback, we'll try out Adobe Flash and our review of the Sony Xperia Ion. So here we are on YouTube playing at 720p because YouTube is not streaming real well at 1080 right now. You can hear the volume, so the quality, just fine. Lovely. So are there any downsides to this machine so far? I've just been saying how wonderful it is. The only thing that I've noticed is that Wi-Fi range on the 5 gigahertz upper band, uh, the range is, well, gee, I'm not going to pick on them like with the uh, SUS Transformer Prime and say it's terrible because it's not, but I do notice about 30 feet from the router that I drop down from our usual 25 megabit up and down to about 22 down and 20 up. So slight degradation there compared to some all plastic notebooks, but still that's perfectly adequate performance. So that's this, the ASUS ZenBook Prime UX31A. It is available now. It's still hard to find. You know, Amazon has it and a couple of stores are, are just picking it up now. It should start to appear in numbers in stores soon. This guy starts at $10.99 list price. You get the 128 gig SSD and the Core i5 1.7 GHz ULV processor. It's fast. It has a class leading display that we've never seen in Ultrabook before. Hardly any notebooks to be honest. It's gorgeous to look at. The build quality is superb. The back of the keyboard is lovely. Everything about it is great. Go get one. I'm Lisa from Mobile Tech Review. Don't forget to visit our website for the full review of the ZenBook Prime UX31A and subscribe to our YouTube channel.